Good evening and uh, thank you again for inviting me uh, to the SAN uh, Prostate Support Group. Um, it's always a privilege to speak at this meeting and uh, every time I prepare this talk I go back and look at what I've used in the last few years and it's always time uh, to be a bit reflective on what we've talked about over the last 10 years or so since I've been doing the talk here. <clears throat> and I always go back and look at my slides from 2005 and just see how much I struggled to put together a talk because we really didn't have much to offer our patients at that time and it was very hard to pull a talk together that was of some meaning and some interest and some optimism. Um, but really in the last few years it's actually become more and more challenging to get a talk covered within a 45 minute period of time because it's just been overwhelming uh, what's been happening in the management of patients with prostate cancer. Um, and it's been a very exciting time to be involved in some of the research uh, that's really changed the way we manage this disease. And we're certainly now starting to see some of the results of some of the trials that we've been involved in and really starting to see the impact that this is having on our patients. And hopefully tonight we'll get an opportunity to discuss them. Obviously there's a lot of things that we're not going to be able to discuss and hopefully if you have burning questions about that we can deal with it in the question time which will probably be best to do at the end. So the first thing I had to do was change the name of my talk because until recently, or until last year, we really would spend, as medical oncologists, would only get involved with patients once they had metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. And we'll talk about what that means along the talk. But really the, one of the biggest changes that's, that's happened in the last year or so is some data that was presented in America in June of last year showing that there may actually even be a role for chemotherapy much earlier in the piece, even in patients with hormone sensitive disease. So that really from the first slide I had to change my talk which has been challenging. Anyway, hopefully we'll deal with all of that. The other thing I thought we'd do is we'd start off with the conclusions because at least that way I'll give you an idea about what I need to talk about and what you'll leave hopefully understanding. And probably the first take home message is that we are all individuals and the, the, the disease that we treat, the patients that we treat are all completely individual and so the management and decisions that we make with each patient is quite individual and that also poses some challenges for me um, answering questions if someone puts up their hand and says I've got prostate cancer that's got this, this it's actually meaningless unless you know everything about the disease because it's quite a heterogeneous disease and how we treat people varies depending on all of that so the first message to take home is that we're all individuals the next is the marked progress that we've seen over the last few years and hopefully you'll get a sense for that um, as we go through the talk. The other thing is that we now really f have got many options and the, the number of options that we have has now become a challenge for us to select which option we use at which time. It's a great place to be but it really does pose a number of difficulties now with sequencing and timing some of these agents. Probably the other thing that we've seen as an oncologist involved in prostate cancer over the last few years is there's been a real paradigm shift from a disease that was dealt with with the degree of nihilism to disease that we now have an optimistic outlook and that's been a very exciting to be a part of. I hope you'll see a few times tonight that as we get to a certain uh, level of treatment or a certain standard of care the goalposts keep me moving and it's a good thing when the goalposts keep moving because they usually move to a better place. And I also just wanted to plug, as you know, um, I have a strong bias towards clinical trials because it really is the clinical trials that have happened over the last few years that have changed the way we manage this disease. And obviously if there's an opportunity uh, for clinical trial involvement, that's always very important and it's always an option that we consider for our patients. I thought I'd also tell you what we're not discussing. And the reason I'm saying this is because I don't want you to think that I think these things are unimportant. These things are critical in managing holistically our patients with prostate cancer, but clearly we'll, we will not have time, we'd be here for two days if I was going to talk about all of these options. Um, the first thing I'm not going to talk about is PSA screening, and that's one of the most controversial areas in prostate cancer at the moment, so I'm just going to leave that alone. Um, that's a discussion for another night. I'm also not going to talk about radiotherapy and all the different radiotherapy options including radiotherapy for oligometastatic disease as part of my normal talk but we can talk about that potentially in question time. But again radiotherapy is an integral part of all levels of prostate cancer management um, but uh, I understand you've recently had a talk by another radiation oncologist about that. I'm not going to talk about surgery, androgen deprivation therapy, bone health, imaging, sexual health, metabolic disease, palliation or individual cases. 
you're probably all sitting there saying, well, what exactly are you going to talk about? Um, but uh, there are some other things. Um, but these are very important things that I hope you appreciate are very important in managing holistically our patients. And all of these need to be integrated in a patient's care, but obviously we're not going to talk about them tonight. First thing we're going to talk about is to quote a great philosopher of our time, Brian from the life of Brian, who stands up and says we're all individuals. And really this is such an important thing in managing our patients with prostate cancer. The first thing to understand is that there's heterogeneity of the disease, which means that within a, the spectrum of patients that we treat with prostate cancer, there's a wide range of the biology of the tumors that we deal with. So some patients will have biologically very slow growing, low grade disease that's never gonna cause them a problem and we don't need to treat them. And other patients are gonna have much more biologically active, aggressive disease um, that need treatment tomorrow. And so prostate cancers are not all the same. And so the first take home message is that there's heterogeneity of the disease. And that is why some people in your group or at your bowling club or wherever are having this particular treatment and other people are not having treatment. We try and understand more the biology of the disease. What's driving the tumor? What's making a tumor behave badly? And what's making a tumor behave well? And by understanding that, we can sometimes select out which are the best and most appropriate treatment modalities. And the things that we use for that, just um, some of the things are the Gleason score, some of the things are the PSA doubling time, but there are a number of other factors that your oncologist would use to try and understand the nature and the biology of your disease. We also look at the extent of the disease. So some patients, now I'm really focusing my talk on patients with advanced disease. So obviously we're not talking about patients with prostate only disease, but in the patients with advanced disease, there's an, a spectrum as well. Aside from the biology of the disease, there's also a, a range of extent of disease. So in other words, some people can have metastatic disease that's very low volume disease or so small that you can't actually see it on the traditional scans that we use. And we've now got even newer scans, which will pick up even smaller volume disease, but that's still a very different disease to patients who've got widespread metastatic disease that's easy to see on a bone scan or a CT scan or on clinical examination. So you can see within that range, there's a whole spectrum of disease that we need to consider. The other thing that we consider is whether a patient is symptomatic from the disease or not. And that's important because if you've got someone with low grade disease that's never gonna cause a problem, you've got to be very mindful about the treatment that you use. If someone's completely asymptomatic and we give them a treatment that's going to make them symptomatic, we haven't done them a favor. And so you're really trying to weigh up which patient really needs treatment now and which patient can wait for a bit. And even what treatment you use, whether we use a particular modality of treatment, whether we use chemotherapy or whether we use some of the newer hormonal treatments. And hopefully by the end of tonight, you'll see this wide spectrum of treatment options that we have. In general, prostate cancer is a disease of older patients, but that's not always true. And even in older patients, an older patient today is different to our older patients of 20 years ago. So we look at the, uh, the, the comorbidities that patients have and the other competing risk factors. So if someone's got a number of other medical problems and are gonna run into trouble with their other medical problems before the prostate cancer is gonna cause a problem, Obviously, you don't need to rush in and use treatment there. Whereas someone's got no comorbidities, no other medical problems, no other competing problems, the prostate cancer will take more, become more of a priority. So all of those things get weighed up together when you see a patient who's got uh, advanced prostate cancer. The other thing I just wanted to highlight is that prostate cancer is a big problem. It, affects almost 20, it affected almost 20,000 men in 2011. It accounts for about 30% of all new cancer diagnoses. It's about the same as is diagnosed in breast cancer. And this is the statistic that I think is, is very important. The five-year survival from 1982 to 1987 was 58%. From 2006 to 2010, is 92%. Now that's a dramatic increase and I think that's a remarkable statistic. Now there's a lot of factors that influence that and some of that is to do with earlier detection and screening, but certainly some of it is to do with um, the new treatments and the progress that we've made. And I think of all, you know, statistics are, are helpful for us to make decisions, but from the, this to me is a very important statistic and it's, it's remarkable to be a part of that. And that's only to 2010. And since 2010, a number of other agents have come into, um, into treatment options now. And so those results you'd expect to be even better. I just wanna put this out there just so you know, and we'll talk about these in more details. This is what we could do in 2004. 
in patients with advanced disease really had a few options. When you look at what we can do in 2014, the, that the treatment options are much more uh, filled and there's many more options. And hopefully by the end of tonight, you'll get a sense for some of these options. And these slides come up a bit, again a bit later. Really what I want to do there is just highlight 2004, we couldn't do much, now we've got a lot of options. I also want to just put in context the type of patients that we're going to be talking about. So this is a spectrum of disease for patients with prostate cancer. And the first thing to say that a lot of patients are picked up at diagnosis with locally advanced disease with whatever modality they get detected and they're treated with whatever definitive local treatment option. Now for some patients that's the end of the journey from a prostate cancer point of view. There's obviously all the other associated issues but from a purely prostate cancer point of view a number of patients will be cured at that stage and won't need any other treatment. But for a proportion of patients, the PSA is going to start rising, which reflects recurrence of their disease. And at the first, pa at the first point, those patients still have disease that is sensitive to hormonal manipulation. And this is the space where we're going to be talking about one of the new treatment options that we have for our patients. The bulk of my talk, and until last year, the only part of my talk was from here onwards, when patients became resistant to having castrate levels of testosterone. In other words, the testosterone levels were abated by whatever means, either orchidectomy or the various uh, injection options that are available. But despite not having any testosterone, the prostate cancer still got worse. And that's where we're gonna be focusing the bulk of the treatment options. And that's where the bulk of the research has occurred in the last few years. So some of the key questions are, so the first group of patients we talked about were those patients with hormone sensitive disease. And the main question that's being asked at the moment since this research of last year is, should we be adding chemotherapy very early in the androgen deprivation therapy treatment? And then the bulk of our talk is gonna be about what we do with these patients with castrate resistant disease and the timing of some of the newer hormone treatments versus chemotherapy, whether we knew, use the newer hormone treatments before or after chemotherapy, and then looking at all these other options that we have available down the track. So you can see that there's been a lot more options and a big, uh, a, a lot of uh, conflicting decision points that we need to make as to the timing of the different treatment options that we have. These are just a highlight of some of the emerging therapies that have been available in the last few years. The first is a new drug called cabazitaxel or Jeptana, which is another chemotherapy agent that's recently been approved. We'll talk about abiraterone and enzalutamide, which are two hormone-based treatments. There's a new bone hardening agent and also some bone targeting agents, uh, which emit small doses of radiotherapy directly to the bone. I'm not gonna focus on these two, um, but those are the agents that we're gonna talk about. I'm also just gonna touch on some information about immune therapy, which has also become an, an exciting treatment modality that's being considered in various research protocols. And there's been a bit of uh, press about that of late as well. So really, the, everything changed in prostate cancer with the TAX327 study. And this was a study that was presented in about 2004. And really what the researchers in that trial did was to try and compare docetaxel, or a drug called Taxotere, which is an intravenous chemotherapy, which is given three weekly, versus a weekly dose of treatment, versus the old standard of a drug called mitoxantride, which is still an effective and useful drug in some situations, and still a drug that we have as an option at some stage in the whole treatment paradigm, in this whole treatment se series. Um, but this trial really was trying to compare which one of these three uh, regimens were better. And these are some survival curves, and we're gonna be showing you a lot of survival curves. Basically, the take home message from these survival curves is if you can see a gap between the two, it tells you that one, line, one uh, treatment is better than another. I know I said this last year, but um, one of the professors I trained with said to us that um, if you could get a laser pointer between the two lines, um, that's a positive study. So what they used to do for prostate cancer research was make smaller laser pointers, so you could easily get it in there. But now with such effective drugs, we don't need to focus on laser pointer development. The other thing you can see is that even if you're a nervous presenter and you've got a trembly arm, you can still get the, way, uh, the pointer through there. So that was an important study because it's really for the first time shown that we can make a difference to survival and improve patients' outcomes. But in patients who've got metastatic disease where we're not aiming to cure the disease, we're trying to improve things, we can't just focus on survival. And so there are a whole lot of other factors that um, were also shown to be uh, 
uh, beneficial. And that is the survival was better, as we talked about, improved pain response, improved PSA, but improved quality of life as well. So even despite the chemotherapy toxicities and side effects, the fact that it had an impact on the disease translated to an overall improvement in quality of life. So that's very important. It's the first time we've seen both a survival benefit and a quality of life benefit. This study was parallel with another um, study done through the states, which also showed the same improvement in outcomes. So this really reinforced that. And then in, uh, at that time, 19, in 2004, 2005, this really changed the standard of care. And for the first time, patients with very advanced disease who'd been through all their other treatment options had a 30% more people survived two years than they had without receiving taxotere. So it was a big impact on survival and obviously the other benefits of quality of life and, um, and improvement in symptoms. The important thing though is that it is chemotherapy and it's not for everyone. And what we need to try and do is weigh up exactly which patients are most likely to benefit from the treatment. So we need to understand which disease requires the treatment. So you know how we talked about the heterogeneity of the disease and what are some of the features of certain diseases that, are make them, that would make that patient more likely to benefit from chemo. We also need to understand some of the patient characteristics, so which patients are more likely to tolerate and benefit the chemotherapy, and then juggling between those to try and select what is the best time to actually start that treatment. So just because someone has advanced disease and we have taxotere or docetaxel, I should say, available, doesn't necessarily mean we need to do it straight away, and it's all about working out when is the optimal time and who's the optimal patient for that treatment. And that's what a lot of the research is looking at now to try and select out best who's the most appropriate treatment for which, uh, most appropriate patient for which treatment. Aside from having the benefits that we've talked about from a survival and quality of life point of view, Taxotere really changed the landscape in how we manage prostate cancer all of a sudden prostate cancer research became interesting. For the first time, people were starting to see positive results. We could now say we've got an agent that makes a difference, and that encouraged a whole lot of research into combining it with different treatments, what we used after taxotere stopped working. Let's see if we can maybe bring taxotere earlier in the piece or um, in people with low volume disease, or see if we can use it in the adjuvant or neoadjuvant setting. So a whole lot of questions started being asked now that we had an agent that made a difference and that really opened the gates to start doing some other research. And really at the end of the day the thing that's going is most important about this is the appropriate timing and patient selection. So once we'd established that uh, docetaxel or taxotere um, is the first line treatment, people started looking at well what do we do next? When the taxotere stops working, now can we start looking at other treatment options? And there was another important study that was done called the Tropic study, which tested a drug called cabazitaxel or Jeftana, which has recently been made available in Australia. And this is a useful drug in patients after prior treatment with docetaxel. And this is a study that confirmed this by showing patients who'd previously been treated with taxotere were randomized to either receive cabazitaxel or mitoxantrone, which would be considered the old standard at that time. And again, another survival curve, easily get your pointer through there, showing a survival benefit. So we've seen that by adding this drug, even once patients have had taxotere, there's an option of getting a benefit with using another chemotherapy agent. And the other thing that was important, that what we've done is added a chemotherapy to another chemotherapy, and they're actually from a similar class of drugs. So some people were concerned, what happened to those people who did badly with taxotere? or whether taxotere didn't work. Does it make sense to use another drug roughly in the same family with a similar mechanism of action? And this graph shows that even in those patients where taxotere didn't have a major effect or they relapsed very soon after stopping taxotere, there is still a survival benefit. So it shows that this drug works if you've had a good response to taxotere and it also works if you haven't. There's a potential for benefit as well. So really what we've established is that they're now two different lines of chemotherapy that we can use. And I hope what you start seeing is that in managing this disease, what we're hoping to do is just add one, many more lines to keep that whole program and that whole process of keeping the disease under control for as long as possible. So now what we've done is just slotted in two lines of treatment before our old standard of mitoxantrone. 
The real excitement started happening when people started understanding the biology of the disease um, prior to this. Now, one of the things that I alluded to before is that after a period of time, patients become resistant to hormones. And we used to call the disease hormone refractory disease, which implies that the disease is resistant to hormonal therapy. But what was actually happening is that as we start understanding the androgen receptor, which is basically the receptor that receives testosterone on the outside of prostate cancer cells, it's a much more complicated um, and difficult uh, receptor that keeps changing and keeps moving its goalposts. And what we found was that if you blocked, if you took away all the testosterone and patients deteriorated, there were still some things that you could do with other hormones. So in, in other words, they were not completely resistant to being to hormones, so they're not really hormone refractory. They were just resistant to, testo to castrate levels of testosterone. In other words, no testosterone, but you could still use other hormonal manipulations to achieve a benefit. And this is because it seems that the androgen receptor changes and is not completely dependent on testosterone. So it uses other pathways. So that gives an opportunity to start targeting some of the other pathways that we can now block and affect um, prostate cancer. And one of the things that was found was that the androgen receptor sits on the outside of prostate cancer cells and we were blocking that by using the tablets and the injection with stopping the testosterone from getting into that receptor. But the prostate cancer was saying, was saying well, okay, doesn't matter what you're doing on the outside, we'll make testosterone ourselves on the inside. So you could block as much as you like on the outside. Eventually that will not be, continue to uh, con uh, achieve a response. It will work for a period of time, but when that stops working, we've got to say, well, what are the alternatives? And one of the alternatives is to target that pathway on the inside of prostate cancer cells. And that's exactly what this drug Abiraterone or Zytiga does. And this is a drug that's recently been um, approved in Australia, but it basically <coughs> blocks testosterone at the adrenal gland level, at the testes level, but importantly on the inside of the cancer cell level where it blocks the uh, formation of testosterone. And so a study was done internationally and we were fortunate enough to be uh, uh, involved in the study and a number of our patients participated and as a result of that were able to access this drug very early in the piece. And this, drug was, this uh, study was presented in 2010. Um, the study started a couple of years prior and this was really for people who'd previously been treated with chemotherapy. When the disease relapsed, they were offered participation in this trial where they received either the abiraterone or placebo, and the reason we could do a placebo study in this space was because the standard of care, or what we would normally use if patients were not going on this trial, would be placebo, because we would have exhausted all the other treatment options. And so that's why this was a reasonable study. It was very importantly showed a marked improvement in survival. And as a result of that, patients enrolled on the study who were in the placebo arm were able to access this drug as well. But very importantly, this was a study now where we'd shown that even though patients um, had exhausted the hormonal options, by doing something else with the hormone therapy, we could then achieve a benefit as well after prior chemotherapy. And this drug is a tablet. It's generally well tolerated. It doesn't have much in the way of side effects, but like everything, there are some side effects. And the main ones are listed here, being the retention of fluid, some changes to the electrolytes in the bloodstream, some liver function abnormalities and sometimes some bl uh, blood pressure problems, but generally very well tolerated. As a result of this, the investigators, investigators said, well, this drug looks like it works very well after chemotherapy. Let's see what happens if we bring it in before chemotherapy. And this was the Cougar 302 trial. Again, we were um, uh, privileged enough to be involved in this study. And this study looked at giving this drug before patients had taxotere. And what you can see from this is again a marked improvement in outcomes in those patients on this trial. And again, this study allowed patients who were on the placebo arm to access this drug down the track. And that's one of the reasons why there's a you know, why the curves cross, because the patients even on the placebo arm were able to access the drug. But the main message from this is that this drug, abiraterone or Zytiga, showed a benefit after chemotherapy and it showed a benefit in survival, in quality of life, in PSA control, and in their pain management. It was then shown later that not only does it show a benefit before chemo um, after chemotherapy, it also shows a benefit before chemotherapy. So now we start having the problem, well, 
when should we use it, before or after chemotherapy? And there's some of those factors that we talked about, about the heterogeneity of the disease and the heterogeneity of our patients to try and say, well, which, when should we use that drug? This agent is now approved in Australia after chemotherapy, and it's also approved in Australia for patients who are deemed unsuitable for chemotherapy. They can have it up front. We've talked about the uh, side effects, which are generally well tolerated, but the other important issue that now arises is how do we fit this all in? When do we sequence this drug compared with all those other options that we talked about before? And then to complicate matters further, another drug was looked at in a similar vein. Now this is just a complicated slide for me to remind, to, to remind me to tell you that the next drug, MDV3100 or Enzalutamide or Extandi, uh, as, it, um, as it's currently known, is an, also a hormone drug, but that works a little differently to the abiraterone, which blocks the sort of testosterone production pathway. This binds to the receptor, but it binds to the receptor on the outside much more tightly than some of the older um, uh, uh, tablets that have been used. And what this uh, group of uh, researchers did was establish that after chemotherapy, if patients are randomized to enzalutamide and looked at their overall survival, again, another curve which shows a significant survival benefit. And then what they did as well, similar to the abiraterone story, they said, well, if it works after chemotherapy, let's see what happens if we bring it in before chemotherapy. And again, this was a study that we were involved in, and it showed a marked difference in the survival and the development of X-ray changes consistent with uh, progression of the disease. It also showed that you could significantly the delay the time that people uh, delay the time of commencing uh, chemotherapy. Again, this is a well-tolerated treatment with the main side effects being fatigue, sometimes uh, some blood pressure problems, and very few other side effects, but overall, very well tolerated treatment. So we're seeing a similar, similar slide to the slide I showed you before about Zytiga or um, uh, um, abiraterone, and again, we're seeing a benefit after chemotherapy in all the aspects, survival, quality of life, PSA control, and pain management. We've also shown a benefit pre-chemotherapy and that agent is also available after chemotherapy and for patients um, who are not fit enough for chemotherapy, they're able to get it up front. So the same question rises, where do we sequence this? And then just to make matters worse, if you could call it that, but it's obviously better because it gives us more choices, which one of those two agents do we use? So now we've got all those different questions to ask um, when we see a patient with disease. So, Obviously, you guys are sitting here, the elephant in the room, saying, okay, so this guy's giving us a talk about prostate cancer. He's telling us all about all, but he actually doesn't know which order he's going to give the different drugs in. And that is true if you're sitting for a general audience. Because as I'm trying to really uh, punch, drive the point home, it is all, the treatment is all completely individualized based on the disease and based on the patient and based on how many treatments and what treatments patients have had before as to how we select them. So it's not quite as confusing as this uh, outlines. This is just a way that we can put the general issues in perspective. But those are the things that would be taken into account while your oncologist is discussing these options. And I think this highlights where we're at at the moment. We've got many choices and many options. I showed this slide some, uh, the other night to another group and the, the one person pointed out, yeah, but there's only one green light, which concerned me a little bit. Um, so we've got to try and get a few more green lights on there. But um, I, I think this highlights the difficulty that we, that we faced with in managing this disease. But some of the questions that come in when we're trying to decide how to choose which uh, treatment we should use for which patient, the first thing is the timing. When do we use it? Can we afford to sit and wait? Or do we need to start treatment tomorrow? The biology of the disease and the biology of the patient. Um, we need to weigh up toxicity. So some people say, look, I don't want to experience the chemotherapy side effects now. I've got this and this happening in my life. I'd rather have this approach. Whereas others say, I'd rather get on with the chemotherapy now and have this other agent up my sleeve for reserve down the track. So we weigh up the toxicities and which what price you prepare to pay at what time, I don't mean financial price, I mean toxicity price or side effect price at what time of what stage of the illness. Um, there's a whole lot of new biologic agents that are now coming um, onto the market and are coming into clinical trials. And so those are other agents that we're now also going to need to slot in to the whole treatment uh, process that we put our patients through. 
sequencing is something that we've, uh, we've talked about and really that's becoming the critical thing and the main thing that we talk about in our consultations and obviously the cost is an issue. At the moment we're very fortunate in Australia in that most of these agents, well all of these agents that we've talked about are currently available one way or the other um, but they do add a, a significant cost and some of these agent costs you know four or five thousand dollars a month um, which is paid for by the PBS but it, it certainly is a healthy economic cost so we've got to be sure that we um, that the benefit that we achieve is justified but it's very difficult obviously as a doctor your priorities to the patient in front of you but there clearly are some health economic issues that need to be discussed at a much higher level this I just put in there because to highlight that this whole question of sequencing is becoming very important and there's a lot of research now working out what sort of tumors are better to have which agent first and do we do harm by giving X drug first in this sort of tumor and should we rather be using Y drug so it may not just be that we have to slot all these agents in at, a, at, at some time at some arbitrary time it may be important that you actually slot drug X in before drug Y for that particular type of tumor and for this particular type of tumor you need to put drug Y in before you put drug X in so these are things that are happening in current research this just highlights some of the drugs that have been approved in the last four years in Australia and really being involved in prostate cancer in the last few years is remarkable. There's very few other diseases where we've seen such a, a, a large number of drugs which have all had survival benefits all being added at the same time. So going back to the key questions that we talked about, really what I've been focusing on is this bit now. So hopefully you get a sense that we've got the option of using some of these newer hormonal treatments, we've got the option of chemotherapy, we've got the option of these other hormonal treatments either there or there, and then we've still got the option of these other chemotherapy drugs and some of the other second line <coughs> chemotherapies and targeted agents down the track. One of the questions that are now being addressed, and this has really come about from research um, presented at the American Society meeting in the plenary session yesterday, uh, yes, last year, um, looked at the issue of giving chemotherapy upfront in people with hormone sensitive disease. Chris Sweeney is a friend of mine and he um, had a, the privilege of presenting at the American Society plenary session. That's the plenary session where there's um, four papers, four of the pivotal papers of the year are presented in front of a measly audience of about 25,000 people and it goes worldwide, it's really a critical paper and he really showed in this um, talk it, that um, there is a potential for using chemotherapy upfront in people with certain types of metastatic prostate cancer at the time that we first initiate their hormone therapy and so he performed the charted trial which looked at giving chemotherapy upfront with standard hormone therapy versus standard hormone therapy. Now this is a highly select group of patients and it's patients with significant metastatic disease but again you guys are getting familiar with these uh, survival curves but a clear survival advantage and particularly in people with very high volume disease or very bad news disease there was a major benefit. Now this hasn't been presented in a, a formal manuscript at this stage but certainly there was a lot of excitement about this research and it probably has been practice changing. A similar study has just in the last week or so been presented at the American um, uh, Urology meeting, um, a UK study called the Stampede study which has shown similar results. So we've got two uh, studies which look like there is a benefit in giving chemotherapy early in the piece in people with uh, hormone sensitive disease. So just going back to the slides that we talked about before you could see that in 2004 the options that we had for our patients were pretty minimal. We could offer them chemotherapy which just came out that year. The year before that all we had was this and so then we had those options and now we're in this situation and the other thing is that we've got some new bone health agents and also the thing to highlight is that all along this way there's a number of clinical trials that we continue uh, to try and get our patients to become involved in because it does offer patients access to some of the newer agents but importantly it's through those clinical trials that we've seen the advances that we've seen in the last few years to try and um, further push the boundaries and do better for our future patients. So I think in summary hopefully you've seen that this is a rapidly evolving space. The goalposts keep changing and though it's hard to keep up with them it's a very important thing and a very positive thing that we keep moving the goalposts. I think the established first line treatment for people with advanced symptomatic uh, and significant uh, metastatic prostate cancer is still chemotherapy. 
There's much debate about the timing of whether we use some of these hormonal treatments before or after. Sequencing is a, a theme that I keep bringing up because that really is the challenge that us as oncologists are faced with at the moment. Um, and then just to highlight the importance of supportive care. As you can imagine, the consultation is very complex dealing with all these issues with choosing treatment. But at the end of the day, we're not just treating a prostate cancer, you're treating the whole package. And there's a patient that comes and a family that comes at the end of that. And it's very important that the, some of the stuff that I talked about are the things that we're not talking about don't get forgotten along the way because the support of treatment, both from psychological support to general health support to the other medical issues, to the complications of treatment, et cetera, et cetera, the whole support of care um, treatment is very important. So going, just going back to our conclusions, um, I think we'd agree that, um, I hope you agree that we are all individuals and the treatment is, is targeted particular, uh, specifically to a particular case. I think you'd agree that there is uh, marked progress. We do have lots of options. The sequencing and timing is what's the, the critical issue for your treating oncologists at the moment. And I think there's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm in how we treat prostate cancer. And I think we have changed from treating this as a, with a fairly nihilistic approach to one of more optimism. Um, and the goalposts keep shifting, which is fantastic. And again, just to give um, clinical trials a plug yet again. So we've taken a few leaps of faith along the way. Um, but I think through those leaps of faith, there has definitely been some progress. And um, I hope to, that we continue to be able to offer these to our patients now, but certainly with more ongoing research, hopefully we'll be able to offer even better outcomes and better selection uh, of treatments for our patients. So I may stop there, and that gives us a few minutes for some questions. Gavin, I just have a question about um, some of the processes of, um, uh, that might be involved. When you have a, a radical prostatectomy, um, the uh, uh, gland is taken out and presumably goes to um, pathology somewhere. To what extent can um, some of these drugs be applied in a, in a test tube sort of um, way to test for that specific uh, cancer that's offered there? I think that's an excellent question. That really is the research that, that's where we are at the moment with, with clinical research. So I'd have to say that at the moment, today, using that as a discriminator of what treatment we use, we're probably not quite there yet. But what happens is that nowadays what we do is look at some of the basic features of the tumor, so the Gleason score, whether there's, um, you know, there's a whole lot of pathologic features such as the margins, seminal vesicles, perineural invasion, vascular invasion, all of those factors which help give us a sense for whether this is more likely to behave in a, a locally advanced way, so in other words, more likely to cause problems just locally in the pelvic bed, or whether it's more likely to cause problems in a more disseminated or systemic approach. So that's the sort of crude, that's what we could do today, and that would help decipher some of the treatment options or modalities that we use. We also tend to use um, some of the more aggressive treatments or cytotoxic chemotherapies for disease which looks biologically more active, although that is a controversial issue. What's starting to happen now is that, and, and the other thing that we need to point out is we've highlighted, we've talked a lot about heterogeneity of the disease, but even within a patient, there is heterogeneity of disease. So in patients with metastases, we see some metastases respond better than others to a particular treatment. And there may be a discrepancy between the genetic makeup of the MET here and the MET there. And that obviously could have some implications on the treatment choices that we make. And we're starting to understand that now a bit better. But I think the, the key for the future, and this is really what's starting to happen now, and there's been a bit of uh, press in the media about this as well, you know, just recently, where there are some uh, research options to look at a particular tumor and see what gene is driving that particular tumor to hopefully guide you to say, well, you know, it's more appropriate to use drug X than drug Y for this patient. We're not at the stage yet where that's been formally tested and shown, yes, well, actually, if you do use drug X in this situation, that patient does better. So it's a bit academic at the moment, um, but it's the obvious way of the future. Some other diseases, so in breast cancer and in bowel cancer, um, you know, the research is a bit more advanced there and we are using specifically targeted treatments to a specific mutation. Um, probably not quite there yet with prostate cancer, but I think, you know, prostate cancer research overall is a few years behind 
you know, some of those other diseases which had much more research funding, much more enthusiasm and much more interest in the 90s than, than, than we had in, in prostate cancer. So I think in summary, it's the way of the future. It's what's happening now as far as research. Is it ready for prime time today? Probably not to help us guide decisions, but you know, in the next, uh, probably not by my next year's talk, but in my, if I get invited back by these guys, but in, in my two or three years talk, um, I think that would be um, an option. With the hormone therapy, um, there's always been uh, a little bit of uh, discussion about uh, inhibitant strategies and so forth. Intermittent? Uh, yeah. And um, uh, I guess having um, taken in some of your uh, uh, talk here, it, it seems that um, w one of the downsides of uh, inhibitant strategy before was that... Um, uh, you leave um, for a period of time in which the um, you know either volume of cancer uh, increases and so forth, and you get a, a recurrence. Um, but it seems like uh, the po a possibility of um, uh, inhibitant strategy and then coming onto one of these strategies is that a possibility? Now that you've just asked this question, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my first slide about what we're not talking about and yep. put in there intermittent hormone therapy because <laughs> <laughs> that's another whole talk in itself and it is a complex area. But I think we should. I think it's a it's a very important question, and um, I think the correct answer to that would be we're not sure exactly how that all fits in. And I'll tell you what the issues are. So just to recap for the, the group exactly what intermittent therapy is. So one of the strategies that has been considered is to, you know, we, we can give the, the LHRH agonists, which are basically the drugs which block the pituitary, the, the brain production of the hormone that stimulates the testes. And those are really achieved by the different uh, branded injections that are used. So you can continue that, you can use that continuously where every one, three, four, or six months, depending on the half-life of the drug you're using, um, you effectively block testosterone continuously. So whenever it's due, you hit the patient again and you eliminate the testosterone. One of the strategies that has been considered is to say, what if we just give that treatment for a period of time, and then when the levels of testosterone are castrate and the disease has come under control, give patients a break off the treatment so that they can feel better, get their testosterone levels up, it helps their bone health, it could potentially help their cardiovascular health, it helps their quality of life, well-being, sexual health, um, and hopefully there was some theoretical um, <coughs> Uh, potential benefits that it may delay the time that people became castrate resistant and that was based on some uh, animal research. Um, so there was a big trial that was done to evaluate whether intermittent treatment is safe. Now before I talk about that trial I just want to say that this discussion is really for people with hormone sensitive disease. It's not really been useful for people with castrate resistant disease but there's another whole question in patients with castrate resistant disease saying well if they castrate resistant, how important is the hormone treatment in that? At this stage, that research is still going, ongoing and, and we really don't know the answer to that. But at this stage in those patients, we should effectively continue the hormone treatment. The controversy is in the patients with hormone sensitive disease, should we be using intermittent treatment? Now there was a study presented at the plenary session at the American Society meeting the year before. So that's two years in a row that we've had a plenary session about prostate cancer. But the year before, a plenary session was done looking at that question about intermittent versus continuous. Now, it is probably one of the most controversial studies that we, we've had in prostate cancer and it's, it's raised a lot more questions than, um, than answers. Now there were some difficulties in interpreting the statistics of how that study was designed. And there were some controversies about the timing. So what they did in the intermittent treatment is you, you take patients off therapy and then when their PSA goes up to a certain level, you start the hormone treatment again. So they could have anywhere between 3, 6, 9, 12, 24 months off treatment before you use the treatment again. Now there were some controversies about the thresholds that they used to restart the treatment. But effectively, that study showed that the outcomes were probably a bit worse in people who are on intermittent treatment than on continuous treatment. But it was more of a statistical issue and there were a few um, controversies and questions about the study and so it's become difficult to interpret. The bottom line is that study is never going to be done again. It is a huge study and there's so many other questions that are going to be asked. So we're kind of left in a situation now where 
We've got a study that shows, you know, if you read the bottom line of the study, it's better to be on continuous treatment, but there are a few problems with that. So I think the answer to that is that you need to sit down with the doctor and have a discussion about the pros and cons. Now, one of the other issues in doing a study where you're looking at intermittent treatment, what you're really doing is looking at testosterone levels. That's what you want to see. So some of the patients who are on intermittent therapy, um, their testosterone levels take a long time to rise. So they're effectively still on continuous treatment, although they're not getting the injection. And one of the things that weren't measured was the testosterone. So you know, PSA and survival were measured, but probably an important thing to measure was what was the actual testosterone doing? Because if you're on intermittent therapy and your testosterone is zero, you're effectively on continuous therapy. So that's also been a bit hard to interpret in the data. So I think intermittent therapy is worth a discussion. There are definitely some pros and there are definitely some quality of life issues for individual patients, although in the study it didn't show that there was a big difference in quality of life. But you could argue that, well, some of it could be because the people on intermittent treatment were still effectively castrate, so they were effectively on, on continuous. So it's a complex issue. Um, and next year I'll put that on my do not discuss slide. But I hope that gives you an overview of what the dilemma is with that. As a discussion, it's probably only relevant now for hormone sensitive disease. In the castrate resistant disease, people are starting to ask the question about what those, uh, where those agents play a role. But at the end of the day, as long as your patients are aware of the pros and cons, and some people make a choice from a quality of life point of view not to do it, and they, you know, so it comes back to case by case basis. Thank you. Might be a silly question, but what does castrate resistant mean? Sorry, I should have clarified that. So basically, what I was trying to say earlier, castrate resistant means that your disease is res resistant, in other words, it's growing, despite having castrate levels of testosterone. In other words, no or you know, completely suppressed testosterone, which can be achieved by those injections that we talked about, or by having an orchidectomy. Um, so surgical removal of the testes, which eliminates the testosterone, which we think is the main driver of prostate cancer. But as I was saying, after a period of time, the prostate cancer starts finding other ways to, to grow despite that androgen receptor, despite the testosterone receptor. So castrate resistant is the new term that we use for people where their disease continues to grow despite the fact that they don't have testosterone, which is what we understood was the main driver of prostate cancers. And it is the main driver in the early part, but as the disease becomes more advanced and changes and modifies, it, um, um, it becomes castrate resistant. There's an, the, the androgen receptor is, is, is a, there's a lot of research now about the androgen receptor, which is much more complicated than we originally thought. So one of the strategies that is used along the way of, of, of treating patients who have got um, hormone-sensitive disease, which is still sensitive to the, the impact on blocking testosterone, is after a period of time. So the first thing we do is we, we block the testosterone uh, by those injections. So you reduce the testosterone that's being produced. After a while, the cells will become resistant to that. And so one of the things, one of the strategies you can use um, is to block the receptor by using one of the anti-androgen tablets. And there's a bunch of anti-androgen tablets. And that sits in the receptor. So that blocks the receptor. So you've reduced the testosterone by the injection. And you've got another um, mechanism by blocking the receptor. And the prostate cancer cell then says, OK, thanks very much. I'm not getting my testosterone this way. It mutates or changes and uses that anti-androgen drug that we're using to block the receptor as if it's testosterone. And in about 20% of cases, if you say, OK, well, thanks very much, we'll take that drug away. So it's called an anti-androgen withdrawal. So you take away the drug that we were using to prevent it, you actually get a response. And that's what's happening is that this receptor is a dynamic receptor. And it's changing as it needs. And that's what we've got to be doing is changing around how that receptor is behaving. So the receptor that you're dealing with now is different to the receptor that you were dealing with at the start of the treatment. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, it's in relation, say you're trying to assess a patient for the most appropriate treatment. Now you've got all these various options. 
do you is that something that you have to do or do you sit around a table like remove the elephant out of the room there right and discuss it with other other yeah. colleagues because yeah. it's a terribly difficult thing to try and yeah. come up with that solu best solution so um yes it is and we have a multidisciplinary meeting here yeah. um so there's a bunch of people in that meeting and we would present um uh, all of our new diagnoses and uh, a lot of other cases at that meeting but i suppose some of these questions uh not always relevant from a radiation oncology point of view or a urology point of view, although those, that part of the team are integral in the holistic care of patients for the decision about sequencing and timing. Um, it's probably more the domain of the medical oncologist. And as medical oncologists, we've got a bunch of uh, doctors who are, have got a particular interest in prostate cancer. We would meet regularly in the complex cases we talk about. We've got a little chat between a few of us, and we can just say, you know, by email, I've got a guy with da 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 da. What do you, what does the group think? Um, but a lot of these things are stuff that we would do on a day-to-day -day basis that probably wouldn't warrant that sort of discussion. But a lot of our cases would be presented for that discussion. My question's to do with uh, several friends that I've lost recently due to pneumonia but they've all had cancer, some prostate cancer, and then d other cancers developed. Um, this is fantastic news, uh, you know, for, for a lot of people. But sometimes, just when you think things are going along swimmingly, the, the pneumonia seems to get you. Does, do, do all these, particularly chemotherapy treatments, do they predispose you to um, uh, dying of pneumonia rather than the very thing that was uh, you were you were having all this complicated uh, treatment for in the first place yeah look um, that would be a, an exceptionally unusual complication of chemotherapy but one of the problems with is this okay? one of the problems with chemotherapy is that uh, it does drop the immune system and depending on the drugs that we use we can kind of predict what's what timing what day after the chemo your counts will be at the lowest level and obviously when your blood counts particularly the white cells which are the cells that help fight off infection if they're at a low level then you'll be more prone to developing an infection and if you are more prone to developing an infection you also less you you, you have less of an ability to overcome that infection and so people can get very sick and people can even die from from the complications of that. That's exceptionally uncommon and we spend a lot of time educating our patients that if you do have any sign of an infection, you need to be straight in hospital. And generally, if that occurred, we could, you know, support them with the necessary antibiotic therapy and white cell stimulators or whatever is needed to try and get them over that. But chemotherapy is a risk, and that risk of death from chemotherapy is exceptionally low, but it is a theoretical risk. And, and that comes up in the decisions that we make in trying to select the patients who are a bit less prone to that, mm -hmm. and also who, you know, if if the risk of dying from the disease is higher than the risk of dying from the treatment, it would be something that we need to take into account. But if the risk of running into trouble from a complication from the treatment is too high, that's exactly that group of patients that chemotherapy would not be the most appropriate option and we'd look at one of the other options. So it's a very uncommon side effect, but all chemotherapies, not all, but most chemotherapies will have some impact on the immune system and it does make you more prone to that. Just one more. Um, you mentioned in your talk about um, qualifications for various drugs into into a uh, certain class of, uh, of of patient, which is probably a, a uh, financially controlled uh, thing from the government. Is it? Um, so my question is: To what extent is the gap between good medicine and you know government control, if you like? Uh, a, a uh, either limitation or a problem? Sure. Look, there is always the problem of uh, balancing the health economic budget. Um, a lot of the drugs, though, that do get approved, and I think in general in prostate cancer we really have been quite... For, I, I mean, in my opinion, some of the treatments could have been approved a little bit earlier than they were, but as we stand today, we pretty much have access to all of the drugs that we would generally want to use for prostate cancer. And that's based on the fact that Whenever there's a, a study uh, that shows a benefit that's presented to the relevant uh, health authorities um, that gets approved um, based on the survival benefit, the quality of life benefit, and the cost comes into that as well. Um, but so yes, the cost does come into it to some degree. 
Um, but at the end of the day, if you've got a drug that does show a significant benefit, I think as, the, as it stands at the moment, we, we really do have most of the drugs that are, that are covered. But there was a little bit, you know, I, there were some of my patients who I would have liked to have started on these treatments a little bit earlier than they were approved. Um, and often in that situation, there are ways that um, that can be funded. Some patients will self-fund it. There's some compassionate use um, or compassionate access programs that we can sometimes use. Um, in, in prostate cancer, though, at the moment, um, we pretty much got most of the drugs that we want to use.